is Matt Schweisberg, S-C-H-W-E-I-S-B-E-R-G. I may have been all done already, but I'm starting from the top. Who am I? Um, as I said earlier, I spent nearly 33 years with the US EPA, five and a half at the headquarters office, one of which was in the hazardous waste program, Superfund program, and then 27 years in the New England regional office. While in New England, I served as the senior wetland ecologist. Um, I also worked for four years, in my last four years of federal service, on the International Joint Commission for the St. Croix River Watershed Council in Maine. I worked on over 30 hazardous waste sites throughout New England regarding wetland impacts and appropriate remedial actions in wetlands for remediating hazardous waste, mostly in or next to wetland areas. Lastly, along with a small cadre of EPA scientists, senior scientists, I served on what I call a SWAT team, a small SWAT team for the agency, and we would assist regional offices upon request with controversial projects uh, and travel around the country and work with them on developing uh, documents and testimony and that kind of thing. Since I retired from EPA, I also worked on the pebble mine in Alaska, uh, and that's a huge mine, not unlike the North Met Polymet. So um, let me start with some key points here. I gotta get this out of here. And the proposed North Met mine project would result in a discharge of waters containing inorganic mercury, methyl mercury, sulfides and sulfates, dissolved organic matter to tributaries of the Embarrass and Partridge River. The Embarrass and Partridge Rivers are direct tributaries to the St. Louis which forms the northern and eastern boundaries of the Fond du Lac Reservation, which is about 70 to 80 miles south of the site, of the mine site. There are extensive riparian floodplain wetlands along the St. Louis River that contain organic rich soils, that is mucks and peats, Fluctuating water levels in these riparian muck and peat wetlands create ideal conditions, drying out and re-wetting, also called oxidation and reduction, for enhancing the methylation of mercury. You heard Esteban speak a little bit about that as well. There is a direct and permanent surface water connection between the mine and plant sites and the riparian wetlands along the Fond du Lac Reservation, and the contaminated discharges from the North Met Mine would be transported directly downriver to these riparian wetlands. Among other evidence, the specific conductance levels that Nancy talked about earlier spoke to and are clear about the evidence of that direct connection between the mine site and the Fond du Lac Reservation. In late fall, winter, and spring, there's flooding along the St. Louis River that will back up waters into at least the three major streams on the reservation. They are the Fond du Lac Creek, Stony Brook, and Simeon Creek and the wetlands adjacent to those streams. So as such, the contaminated discharges from the mine and plant sites may easily reach and contaminate these three streams and their adjacent wetlands within the reservation. A 
Fish and Wildlife Resources that use the St. Louis River, its riparian wetlands, the three reservation streams, and their adjacent wetlands would be exposed to mercury and methyl mercury, would consume an plant and animal foods containing elevated levels of methyl mercury, and in turn be available to higher trophic levels, including humans that catch and consume fish from the St. Louis River and the reservation streams. Biomagnification of methyl mercury within these animals, the wildlife and the humans, um, is of great concern. Among other species, the band's restoration efforts for lake sturgeon could be compromised. The consumption of methylmercury contaminated foods by fish and wildlife and by humans would impair the designated uses for the St. Louis River and the three streams on the reservation, as well as wetlands adjacent to those areas. And it would affect, I'm just going to read the highlighted points, cultural opportunities, protection of downstream water qualities, and wetland and water-dependent wildlife. The degradation of reservation waters and wetlands will result in non-compliance with the designated uses of the band's water quality standards, as well as its anti-degradation standards. On top of that, the filling and disturbance of wetlands and other waters will result in non-compliance with the Section 404B1 guidelines of the Clean Water Act. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, maybe more than a minute. So you've already heard a lot about the ecological setting, and I'm not going to go through these things, but just to show you, the yellow arrow points to the mine site and the wetlands around the mine site that would be directly affected by the, the drawdown uh, that Esteban talked about earlier. For regional aquatic resources, um, at the mine site, there are numerous small creeks and streams surrounded by an expansive and diverse landscape where the dominant feature is wetland. And as you heard earlier, most of those wetlands are peat and muck based. The Embarrass and Partridge Rivers provide a direct flow path via the St. Louis River to the reservation. And I mentioned earlier that there are extensive riparian wetlands along the Embarrass, the Partridge, and the St. Louis Rivers that contain organic-rich soils, mucks and peats, and these rivers regularly flood during spring from snowmelt and frequent rain. The St. Louis River forms the northern and eastern boundaries of the reservation, and riparian wetlands that exist along those two boundaries total about 9,400 acres. Of these wetlands, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Wetland Inventory classifies about 2,400 acres as seasonally flooded basin or flat wetlands. These wetlands are the type with extensive organic soils, and seasonally flooded wetlands experience fluctuating water levels that, that wetting and drying over the course of a year. Flooded in mid to late winter and spring, and then drying out when water levels recede in the summer and early fall. Fluctuating water levels, as you heard Brian talk about, are ideal sites for where mercury methylation occurs. And along the boundaries of the Fond du Lac Reservation, there are numerous streams and creeks, again, Fond du Lac Creek, Stony Creek, and Simeon Creek, that connect more interior portions of reservation wetlands, including some wildlife rice areas, to the St. Louis River. These wetlands are predominantly forested, shrub, 
and emergent types. Many of these wetland areas are periodically flooded, mostly from backwater flooding from the St. Louis River, where the water backs up into these streams and in part into the wetlands that are adjacent to those streams. Nearly all of these interior wetlands drain to the St. Louis River, which of course drains to Lake Superior. Now just to talk a little bit about the regional wildlife, you have a diverse array of wildlife species that occur in this whole area, all of which are found or can be found on the reservation. And I won't necessarily read most of these, but among them are black bear, timber wolf, moose, badger, marten, bobcat, lynx, fisher, beaver, muskrat, river otter in particular, um, and a lot of small mammals. Birds, waterfowl, ducks, geese, and swans, wading birds like herons and egrets, Birds of prey, such as hawks and falcons. There are bald eagles that visit the area frequently. You get grouse, sandhill crane, woodcock, and a variety of songbirds. There are also many reptiles, many snakes, many turtles, such as snapping and wood turtles and blandings turtle and spiny softshell turtles. There are myriad amphibians, such as frogs. You can see the list on the slide. Um, many of these wildlife species and the fish species on the next slide are culturally significant for the band and needed for the band to exercise its treaty, treaty rights to hunt, to fish, and to gather, as you've heard them say. Just a quick list of some of the fish that are found in the reservation waters and along the St. Louis River, in particular Lake Sturgeon that you've heard about already, a rare species that the band is trying to reestablish. So let me switch now to some adverse impact issues and for adverse impacts to aquatic resources. Polymet says that the proposed project would fill or alter approximately 900 acres of wetlands. However, Polymet and the Corps Polymet and the Corps did not completely evaluate indirect adverse impacts in line with compliance with the NEPA regs, with the Army Corps regs, or with EPA's regulations, especially downstream of the mine and its facilities, and in particular on the Fond du Lac Reservation. In the EIS documents and the Clean Water Act, Act the application, excuse me, Polymet claims only minimal impacts to wetlands, particularly from mercury uh, and other waters. And the core record of decision appears to take that claim at mostly face value. The analysis that you've seen already um, in our analysis in particular shows that the project would fill and alter at least 6,000 acres of wetlands and other waters up and down the St. The St. Louis River watershed, in particular on the Fond du Lac Reservation. This is a glaring omission. Neither Polymet nor the Corps accurately evaluated the adverse impacts of wetlands and other waters from the mine, particularly from the groundwater drawdown and the downstream effects of the mine site, especially on the Fond du Lac Reservation. You've seen the Glyphwick maps already showing the aerial effects of groundwater drawdown from the mine operation. <clears throat> Wetland hydrology, just to get a little technical for a minute, is defined 
as an area with saturated soils at 12 inches or less below the surface for a period of two weeks or longer during the growing season. In areas with organic soils, the peats and mucks that we have here, the water table may actually be lower, even as low as 16 inches, um, and the area still retain wetland hydrology due to the capillary fringe, or due to capillary fringe rise, which is akin to dipping a paper towel in a pool of water and watching it rise up through the towel. It's sort of the same effect in the soil. The final environmental impact statement and Polymet's submission describe the wetlands as perched, that is, hydrologically separated from the regional water table. That's not accurate. And it, it Polymet uses that reasoning to support its contention that there would only be minimal impacts to wetlands on the site from the drawdown of its operation. There are few truly isolated or few, few truly hydrologically separated wetlands from the regional groundwater table. Vertical transmission may be slower at times, and I think you heard Esteban mention that earlier, and you heard Brian talk about that a little. But nevertheless, the wetlands are connected to the regional water table, and there are effects especially when you have long-term drawdown for years, and in some cases, maybe a decade or more, um, with the operation of this mine. The Glyphwick modeling shows a much greater drawdown of the water table. You have the maps, and you saw the maps. The modeling and the outcome has been further supported by the work of USGS, uh, which shows in some cases, even greater drawdown impacts than that analog method that Esteban highlighted. Yeah. I'm not going to go through these maps again because you've seen them a couple of times now. So adverse impacts to aquatic resources. Mercury, and you heard Brian talk about this a little, meth mercury and methylmercury tend to persist long, time, long term in the environment, especially in organic soils, peats and mucks. And when you add sulfate, these areas become prolific incubators of methylmercury. Mercury being one of the most toxic elements to fish and wildlife and humans, especially for vulnerable and minority populations like what you find in the Fond du Lac band. Methylmercury disrupts and causes severe harm to the neurological and reproductive systems in both fish and wildlife and particularly in humans. Polymet's analysis of the groundwater drawdown upon streams and wetlands in the watershed subbasin is inaccurate, and it vastly underestimates the extent of that drawdown and the harm from it. As I said earlier, the FAIS states that over 900 acres of diverse and ecological valuable, ecologically valuable wetlands would be directly filled and altered by construction of the project, including at the mine site and from operation of the mine. However, we determined that when combined with construction and dewatering of the open pit, the operation will lower groundwater and surface water levels around the mine and actually adversely impact directly and indirectly an area that contains over 6,000 acres of wetlands and waters. That acreage does not, and let me stress this, it does not include the indirect effects downstream of the mine facilities, particularly the riparian wetlands along the St. Louis River, and especially to the streams and wetlands along and within the Fond du Lac Reservation.
continuing on adverse impacts to aquatic resources at the Fond du Lac Reservation, fish and wildlife uh, resources that use the St. Louis River, its riparian wetlands, and the streams and wetlands of the reservation will be exposed to elevated levels of methyl mercury, the form of mercury that biomagnifies in predatory species. As you heard Brian talk about that a little bit, and you heard Nancy talk about that. So the highest levels of exposure would be in predatory organisms, including wildlife such as fish-eating birds and mammals like herons and egrets, bear, river otters in particular, and then most importantly perhaps humans, band members that catch and consume fish or that catch and consume wildlife that eat the contaminated fish. Methylmercury exposure is a grave concern for fish and wetland dependent wildlife from the St. Louis River, the three principal streams on the reservation and their adjacent wetlands. And among other species, the band's restoration efforts for lake sturgeon would likely be jeopardized. Project discharges will affect biogeochemical functions of the impacted wetlands, which in turn will uh, substantially affect their ecological functions. The discharges, in addition to seepage that will not be contained by the proposed and wholly unproven seepage catcher system that PolyMet proposes, will result in increases in methylmercury production in headwater streams that provide water and solutes to downstream reaches, especially the St. Louis River and its riparian wetlands. The contaminated discharges from the project, because of the direct surface water connections to the reservation, they will reach and contaminate at least the three principal streams that I've mentioned and their adjacent wetlands. So I'm going to talk for a minute now about the band's water quality standards. Section 701, designated uses of the band's water quality standards, say that for all wetlands, as defined by the Kowarden classification scheme, the uses to be protected include, but are not limited to, among others, cultural opportunities, indigenous floral and faunal diversity and abundance, protection of downstream water quality, wild rice and water dependent wildlife. Discharged waters from the mine and plant site sites with containing elevated levels of mercury and sulfates will interact with dissolved organic matter to generate methylmercury that will be transported downriver to reservation waters and wetlands, especially in the event of high flows and floods like you have at this time of year. Methylmercury will bioaccumulate and biomagnify in fish and other aquatic life, such as otter and mink, in the river, the streams, and the wetlands, and impair designated uses such as subsistence fishing, warm water fish, wildlife, especially fish eating birds and mammals such as herons and river otter, and potentially wild rice areas, which then would be available to humans. You heard Nancy Schultz speak to the adverse effects on the band's designated uses. The other section of the water quality standards for the band is section 703, anti-degradation. And it says that for wetlands, again using the Kowarden classification scheme, there shall be no degradation of existing uses. That's not a little degradation, that's no degradation. Again, using that classification system, there shall be no net loss of the water quality, 
the functions, the area, or the ecological integrity of high value or high quality, among others, palustrine and riverine wetlands, after satisfying applicable anti-degradation provisions, including avoidance, minimization, and mitigation replacement requirements, the authorized tribe, if, unless the authorized tribe that determines that allowing degradation is necessary to accommodate important social or economic development in the area in which wetlands are located. And to the best of my knowledge, the Fond du Lac Band has not made such a finding. You heard Nancy again speak to the adverse effects that violate anti-degradation provisions in the band's water quality standards. So the direct effect of loading water, sulfate, or water with sulfates, and inorganic mercury to headwater wetlands and surface waters from mine operations will be to elevate methylmercury concentrations and result in increases in exposure of fish and wildlife, as well as band members who consume those fish and wildlife. Changes in regional wetland hydrology, and again, you heard previous speakers talk to that, uh, in the area of groundwater impact in the vicinity of the project site will have indirect effects that will enhance mercury, sulfate, and methylmercury releases in the area and data clearly indicate our, that data clearly indicate our already exceeding water quality standards. So this will just exacerbate non-compliance with water quality standards. Project-related changes in hydrology and the release of excess sulfate will stimulate the process of mercury methylation. You heard Brian talk about that a little. Um, and the methylmercury that is produced both adjacent to the project as well as at more distal locations in the St. Louis River watershed, especially on the Fond du Lac Reservation, will contribute to the load of methylmercury in surface waters. And this methylmercury will bioaccumulate and increase exposures of fish consuming wildlife and band members who consume that wildlife. The consumption of methylmercury, of methylmercury contaminated foods by fish and wildlife and by band members will impair the designated uses for the St. Louis River and three principal streams on the reservation, as well as wetlands adjacent to those areas. The degradation of Fond du Lac reservation waters and wetlands will result in noncompliance with the band's designated uses and anti-degradation provisions of its water quality standards. The unavoidable leakages and releases of process water, leachate and stormwater containing mercury, sulfides and sulfates, and inorganic and methylmercury will almost certainly result in degrading the ecological functions and services of the affected reservation waters and wetlands, including existing uses such as the loss of their ecological integrity. Polymet proposes to monitor to determine if noncompliance has occurred, but water quality standards are in effect in the first instance to prevent discharges that result in noncompliance. Polymet's proposed monitoring approach would not comply with the band's water quality standards because the noncompliance would already have occurred. Monitoring to detect a violation and then deciding how to address how to address it in that case is wholly inadequate, it's impracticable, it's unrealistic, and it would result in irreparable harm to the water and wetland resources on the reservation. Such an arrangement makes compliance with water quality standards negotiable instead of mandatory, and that would not comply with the Clean Water Act. I'm going to switch now to compliance with the Clean Water Act Section 404B1 guidelines 
which are the environmental standards that a proposed project or discharge of dredged or fill material into jurisdictional waters and wetlands must comply with in order to receive authorization from the Army Corps of Engineers uh, in a Section 404 permit. So that an individual 404 permit can only issue if the proposed discharge complies with those standards. And the guidelines are bind, despite their name, they are binding regulations and they contain four independent tests. Section 23010A is essentially referred to as the avoidance and alternatives provision. Um, it says that no discharge of dredged or fill material shall be permitted if there is a practicable alternative to the proposed discharge which would have less adverse impact on the aquatic ecosystem so long as that alternative does not have other significant adverse consequences. And this standard is sometimes referred to as the LEDPA, or least environmentally damaging practicable alternative. Sorry. Um, the environmental review process by the Corps for this proposed project under the Clean Water Act Section 404 program was fundamentally flawed. And let me explain a little bit why I think that's the case. A practicable alternative is both available and capable of being done, that is, it's feasible. And those twin aspects are examined in terms of cost, existing technology, and logistics in light of overall project purpose. An available alternative is one that the applicant can reasonably obtain, access, utilize, expand, or manage. In this instance, the basic project purpose is mining and ore processing. As determined by the core in its record of decision, the overall project purpose is to produce base and precious metals, precipitates, and flotation concentrates from the ore mined at the North Met deposit by interrupting, by uninterrupted operation of the former LTV SMC processing plan. The part that starts with from ore mined at the North Met deposit is what creates the problem for the way this has been defined. Um, the incorrect wording here is inappropriate because it eliminates any other alternative site for a mine. The proponent behind this project is a multinational worldwide company and it controls and mines on all continents except for Antarctica. Worldwide company that has holdings everywhere. And yet, the analysis they did only looked at Polymet. It really didn't look at any other mines. It looked at different ways to arrange the features at the Polymet site, but it did not look at other sites. That is a significant flaw. Reading from the ROD, the, the, the Corps' record of decision, the Minnesota DNR and the Corps said it will not evaluate alternative mine, pit, or processing plant sites for this project. An alternative site would not meet the underlying need or purpose. That's NEPA terminology, not 404. Um, the mineralization of the desired elements within a geologic deposit dictates the bottom of the location of the mine. And absent a thorough analysis of alternative sites, again, worldwide for a international corporation, such a, such a conclusion is unsubstantiated. It's inappropriate. An alternative processing plant site would not likely have significant environmental benefits over the existing 
mining industry in infrastructure. You can't know that unless you do the analysis of alternatives and you look at other sites. So again, this is an unsubstantiated conclusion by the Minnesota DNR and especially by the core. As the regulations say, without a thorough evaluation of potential mine locations across the world, either owned, controlled, or reasonably obtained by, obtained by, by Polymet, no documented and defensible determination can be made by the core, or at least should be made by the core, that the PolyMet North Met site is both practicable and least environmentally damaging to the aquatic ecosystem. In looking at all of the documentation that I can find both at the core site, at Minnesota DNR site, and material that PolyMet has submitted, no such evaluation was done. And the regulations are very clear that the burden of proof is squarely on the applicant to clearly demonstrate that its proposal is the least environmentally damaging practicable alternative, or LEDPA. And in the absence of such a clear showing, the 404B1 guidelines require the Corps to deny the application for a permit. Alimed has made no such demonstration. The next independent test is 23010B, which says that no discharge of dredged or fill material shall be prevented, permitted if, among other things, ca it causes or contributes after consideration of the disposal site dilution and dispersion to violations of any applicable state or approved tribal water quality standard. For this project, it's very well documented now that the suspended core permit for the purpose of constructing the mine and the ore processing facilities will cause or contribute to violations of the band's water quality standards. Um, we, the team that is supporting the band in its well effect analysis, explained in great detail the activities that would occur, the effects on the reservations, wetlands, and other waters, and concluded that, among other things, the project will result in the discharge of millions of gallons of water containing inorganic mercury, methyl mercury, and dissolved organic matter to tributaries of the Embarrass and Partridge rivers that already contain elevated levels of methyl mercury. Project discharges will result in direct and seepage discharges of sulfate and inorganic mercury to extensive headwater wetlands in the Embarrass River or Embarrass River watershed and the seven direct wastewater outfalls to the headwater wetlands of Trimble Creek, increasing water lo loadings by several million gallons per day that will supply hundreds of pounds of sulfate per year. That's what makes this all kind of a, an incredible factory for producing methylmercury, if this were to occur. As there is a direct surface water connection between the project site and the riparian wetlands along and within the Fond du Lac Reservation, it is a given that the contaminated discharges from the project will be transported to the riparian wetlands along the reservation, as well as to the streams and some of the wetlands adjacent to those streams within the reservation. The consumption of methylmercury contaminated foods by fish and wildlife and by band members will impair the, de the band's designated uses for the St. Louis River and the three principal streams on the reservation, as well as wetlands adjacent to those streams. The next independent test of the guidelines is 23010C, which has to do with significant impacts and says that except as provided under 404B2, which deals with navigation, 
no discharge of dredged or fill material shall be permitted, which will cause or contribute to significant degradation of the waters of the US. And the guidelines require the analysis of all direct, secondary, also in NEPA, that's our indirect, and cumulative adverse impacts of the affected aquatic resources. Neither Polymet nor the Corps accounted for all secondary and cumulative adverse impacts. And you heard Nancy Shield talk a little bit about that. There's been no evaluation of downstream, which are indirect impacts, mostly and most importantly to the Fond du Lac Reservation. And there's an incomplete in fact, cursory evaluation of cumulative impacts in the contributing watershed or subwatershed. The last independent test in the guidelines has to do with compensatory mitigation. It says that no discharge of dredged or fill material shall be permitted unless appropriate and practicable steps have been taken which will minimize potential adverse impacts of the discharge of the aquatic, on the aquatic ecosystem. And quoting from the Corps' record of decision, it says, to offset unavoidable losses of wetlands associated with the project, with the proposal, I should say, the applicant purchased mitigation credits from the Lake Superior Wetland Mitigation Bank located in the St. Louis River watershed. Wetlands to be impacted by the project are located in the Embarrass and Partridge River watersheds, which are sub-watersheds of the St. Louis River. Therefore, impacts and compensations are located in the same major watershed. The primary wetland type to be impacted and the primary wetland type at the Lake Superior Bank is coniferous bog communities, Therefore, compensation is in kind. That's where you take three and two and you get eight when you add them together. That does not make any sense ecologically, practically, and it does not comply with this section of the guidelines. It's important to note that the adverse impacts described in the final EIS and above are potentially avoidable because the alternatives analysis was not complete. As explained in my, or, or the, the document that I quoted earlier, the complete analysis of the proposed mine for compliance with the guidelines, the applicant has not rebutted the presumption that less environmentally damaging alternatives exist and are practicable. Therefore, because they are likely avoidable, the immense adverse impacts to the aquatic ecosystem from this proposed mine would result from the construction and operation of the mine, and therefore those impacts are significant by definition, more or less. Purchasing credits in a mitigation bank is allowed under federal regulation. However, purchasing bank credits does not adequately compensate for the full range, scope, and the severity of adverse impacts to wetlands, rivers, and streams that I've described above and that others have described. The bank is roughly 25 to 30 miles downstream of the mine site and also would likely be contaminated from mine discharges. That approach could not come close to adequately compensating for the extent, the diversity, and the significance of adverse impacts at the project area. The adverse impacts to water quality, in particular to wetlands and waters on the Fond du Lac Reservation, are not and cannot be adequately compensated by this approach. In fact, those impacts are not compensated at all from whatever I've seen. In fact, there is no scheme under which those impacts could be adequately compensated. I've seen nothing that describes in the materials submitted by Fond du Lac, in the FEIS, uh, 
or in the Corps' application for this permit that describe how those impacts would be adequately compensated. They would not be appropriate or practicable. That approach may, be, may appear practicable, but it is clearly not appropriate, again, for the range, scale, and severity of adverse impacts in this circumstance. The impact, the impacts to this landscape involve not just pristine individual wetlands, but in inextricably linked stream, river, and wetland ecosystems, as well as treaty resources in the ceded territory and the band's reservation. And I think that's real important, that this would adversely impact treaty resources in the ceded territory and on the band's reservation. Finally, and as described on page 60 of the Corps' record of decision, there is considerable uncertainty regarding the extent of indirect effects that may occur to groundwater drawdown at the site. Because indirect effects cannot be determined in advance of impacts, the applicant will monitor areas around the project to assess, to assess the extent of, of changes to hydrology and vegetation that can be attributed to the project. If indirect impacts are found, adaptive management and or compensatory mitigation would be required to offset these impacts. I think as Nancy and to some degree as Esteban and Brian have talked about, um, that's not compensation. The impacts have already occurred. Many of them would be irreparable and simple monitoring, as I think Nancy mentioned, the horses are out of the barn. It's already occurred. Here and elsewhere, the Corps relies solely on monitoring to determine if more than minimal adverse impacts have occurred. It's unsound, it's unscientific, and it's an unsubstantiated approach. And there's a lot in the application from PolyMet that is un substantiated. You heard about some of that from Brian, you heard about some of that from Esteban, and you heard about some of that from Nancy Schultz. Undoubtedly, that approach would result in an additional significant and irreparable adverse impacts to the aquatic ecosystem, resulting in further noncompliance with the applicable regulations in the guidelines. So in conclusion, most of the justification for this project from PolyMet and to some degree from the Corps is not based upon factual information. It is conjecture and it's unsubstantiated. The proposed mine would result in a significant and unacceptable violation of, bands, of the BANS water quality standards. Section 401A2 provides neighboring states and federally recognized tribes with an opportunity to object to 404 permits if EPA determines that the permitted, permitted discharge may affect the water quality in the state or tribe. If the imposition of conditions cannot ensure compliance with the state's or tribe's water quality standards, the permitting agency, in this case the Corps, shall not issue the license or permit. Consequently, the Corps cannot rely on the Minnesota's existing 401 certification to justify the project because it does nothing to address the myriad adverse effects that I and others have described on the band's water quality standards. The proposed mine would fill and alter approximately, well, probably in excess of 6,000 acres of valuable wetlands and waters and result in significant and unacceptable adverse impacts to wetlands and other waters and the fish and wildlife resources that depend on those wetlands and waters, especially those of particular importance to the band, like lake sturgeon, birds of prey, and fur bearers. Consequently, 
the Clean Water Act Section 404 permit must not be permanent, must be permanently revoked and not reissued. And you've heard that from some others as well. And I want to emphasize that there are no proven or effective conditions that could be placed on the Section 404 permit, or for that matter, the water quality certification, to avoid the adverse impacts described or compensatory mitigation that could bring the project, as proposed, into compliance with the applicable regulations. This is not a question of needing more study or data. Lots has been done, and I think it's very clear what the result is. The data is more than sufficient. No discharges is the only remedy in this case. In closing, EPA should not delay or hesitate to invoke its authority under Clean Water Act Section 404C and initiate a veto, a veto action to prevent this project from moving forward. And I think that's all I have, so thank you. Is that mine? I hope. Thank you, Matt Schweisberg, for that great presentation. Um, Matt Schweisberg was the last um, expert that we have to testify on behalf of the band. Um, so we appreciate you all listening um, to all of our presentations. Um, but in closing, uh, before we move on to the rest of uh, the agenda for the hearing, um, the chairman would like to come up and say some closing remarks about the presentations that you've heard today regarding the band's will affect determination. Good afternoon. For those of you who weren't here in the morning, I am Kevin Dupi. I'm the Fond du Lac Chairman. I'd like to thank the Army Corps and Colonel Jensen for listening to the band's presentation during today's hearing. We have completed a list of main witnesses, and I would like to close the band's main case by highlighting the importance of hearing the of this hearing and process and the information that has been presented by the band's experts. As you heard from our experts, the science is clear. The discharges from proposed polymet project will violate the band's downstream's water quality standards and create negative impacts to the band's downstream reservation waters and other uh, treaty resources and cultural resources. These impacts will not only further destroy treaty resources, which we rely, but result in increased exposure to mercury, methylmercury, and the fish and wildlife we consume. This is a real impact and a real human consequences. We are talking about not just the health and welfare of our grandparents, our parents, brothers and sisters, children and grandchildren, and then our unborn but the well-being of our entire culture and our way of life, a way of life that is protected by treaties with the United States. Colonel Jensen, on behalf of the Corps, you have a very big responsibility on your shoulders, sir. You must take all the evidence before you and decide whether polymet 404 permit can be reinstated or whether it must be revoked. We strongly believe, we strongly believe there is only one result that can be reached. Sir, you must revoke and suspend the 404 permit issued to Polymet. The band's downstream state is, and must be treated as, an expert on its own water quality standards. Throughout the, represent throughout the presentations, our experts have been clear, and there are no permit conditions that can be applied or be placed on the 404 permit that would ensure compliance with the band's downstream water quality standards. You have also heard from the EPA on the band's objections, and the EPA recommendations agree with the band. This outcome may seem surprising to some, but it's not surprising to us. We've been saying this for years. On behalf of the band, we appreciate the EPA thoughtfully evaluating the proposed project and the band's objections. 
it came as no surprise to us that the EPA reached the same result as we did because the result is firmly grounded in the science. Though it is unfortunate it took so much work by the band to get us here today, we are thankful that we are here and we ask the Corps to listen to the experts, both the band experts and the EPA experts, and revoke the suspended 404 permit. We urge the Corps to act quickly after the close of the hearing process so this process can finally come to a conclusion. Miigwech. Thank you.